Welcome to part two of the slide talk on uh, sculpture. So now we're going to talk about assembly or assemblage. And with assembly, there's a couple of different kinds of assemblage, different ways that we uh, define it. Basically, it means that pieces or segments are brought together to form a sculpture. Now, in some cases, the parts are sculpted separately and placed near each other. And in other cases, the assembly happens through welding and otherwise attaching the pieces directly together as part of the sculpture. So this is a piece by the guy Roxy Payne, by the artist Roxy Payne. And he does a beautiful job of um, creating these kind of tree sculptures. There's a lovely one in your book on page 248. I was personally drawn to this one because um, on my property, since 2009 ice storm, the forest has taken up its own look. And part of it is that some of the trees look like that. And they still are alive, but I have quite a few trees in the, because I, there's many acres of forest that end up looking like that. So um, Roxy Payne is a very interesting artist, but generally he does these kind of tree sculptures and they are assembled. Now one of the things that makes this possible is steel. Now steel has always been around in some form, but in the late 1800s the technologies were developed that allowed for it to be mass produced. And so as a result we got skyscrapers, we got bridges, we got all sorts of things. And we also got really sturdy sculptures. So let's keep looking at assemblage and talk about our buddy Picasso. This is a famous sculpture by Picasso called the Bull's Head. Okay, I hear some of you going, wait a minute, that's a bike seat and handlebars. Why, yes it is. Now, almost anybody could put that together, but Picasso saw that the bike seat and handlebars was actually a Bull's Head, and he went so far as to create this piece, and now it's one of his more famous pieces. Let's look at Picasso at work. They say he really loved doing assemblage. And this is something about a woman and a cart, but he would just find old junk lying around and put it together and make art. Now another really famous assembly guy is Alexander Calder. Now Alexander Calder invented something called the mobile, right? You've all heard of mobiles. Um, if you have a baby and there's this thing hanging over her head in the, or his head in the crib that's kind of moving around that the baby stares at, well, that's a mobile. And in the 1960s, that was his um, claim to fame. And this is one by Alexander Calder, and it's obviously an assemblage. Probably the, the little pieces he assembled outside of this large piece, and then he would have welded them together. So, so the next topic is huge. It's human figures in art. Okay, so now we have Menkauri, um, he's an Egyptian ruler, and his wife and daughter. Now this is a little different uh, one than is in your book, but let's talk about it. In Egyptian art, the human figure was really one of the primary subjects. And what's interesting about how they portrayed figures was, okay, so we all, we, we all know probably about the convention. Like in Egyptian art, people look stiff and funny. And a lot of times their profile is showing, their chest is showing, and their feet are in profile also. But you know what? The only way you could get sculpted uh, stiff and funny like that would be if you were the royalty. The common people, they were sculpted much more realistically, which is kind of fascinating to study. So these are also sculpted in something called diorite, which is a very hard stone. But really the point of this is that people have been the subject of art and especially of sculpture for a very long time. And here's just a cool photo of them actually being um, unearthed. So if you look in your book at the sculpture of the two Egyptian, the, the pharaoh and his queen, this is what it looked like when they first found them. Isn't that amazing? Now let's talk about the Burgers of Calais. I want you to look at the one in your book because it's a different vision, of, a different view of it, and it will help to explain this. This is by the sculptor Auguste Rodin, and it's a great uh, masterpiece in the history of art. 
In Calais, France, the town was under siege in the 1400s, and the people were starving and dying, can, you know, children dying of starvation, all that business, um, during the Hundred Years' War. Now, these are all the town leaders, and they approached those who were holding the town under siege and said, we will give our lives if you will free our town. And so they did that. So as a memorial, Rodin was commissioned to sculpt these guys as they're making the decision, as they're coming to offer to sacrifice their lives for their town. Now, it took him like over 10 years to get this thing out because at first the town people, they hated it. They were looking for a traditional sculpture. And if you look in your book, you can see it's, it's like almost right on the ground. These heroes, they're not up on a pedestal. They look like real men. They're in agony. But think about it. These dudes are about to give up their life for their town. So this is a big deal. And now it's considered a real masterpiece, but it was groundbreaking in its day. It really moved away from the more conventional academ academic sculpture that we see. So here's another one that's in your book, but I just love this. This is by uh, a Buddhist monk. It's a, a, excuse me, a Japanese sculptor named Kosho, and it's called Kuya Preaching. And what he's doing is he's saying his mantra or his sacred phrase over and over. And what I love about this piece is that it's just so darn literal. I mean, here they are. Little Buddhas are coming out of the guy's mouth as he's repeating this sacred phrase. So um, I just find that really endearing. And it's actually really quite a beautiful piece, too, if you look at the detail of the sculpture. So these are all different ways that human beings have been depicted in art. So in African art, uh, the figure also plays a very important part. This is called a ballet sculpture. It's a spirit spouse. In other words, um, Okay, so you've got your spouse in the earthly plane, but there's also a spouse in the invisible realm. And you better keep this other spouse happy or you're going to have no end to grief in this life. And that is a belief that's depicted by these two figures. We've been looking at art from a variety of traditions um, that depicts the human figure, but let's look at one probably most familiar to many of us, and that would be from the Greek tradition, from the Western art tradition. And this is a sculpture called uh, the Spear Bearer. And it is considered what we call a canon of proportion. In other words, this guy is the ideal guy. He's seven and a half heads tall. He has a certain amount of proportion. And it was viewed as the ideal human, the one to base art from, throughout the Greek and Roman period and also in the Renaissance. But there's something else I want to teach you here. I want to show you, and it's something called contrapposto. You can see it really well in your book on page 253. So be sure and look at that. But here's the deal. Contra means contrary, con you know, one going one way, one going another way. Contrapposto. Pasto, you could think of posture. So look at this. His shoulders go kind of up at a slant uh, to the viewer. The left side's just a touch lower than the right side. His hips go the opposite direction. This is considered a classical pose in art. And the term contrapposto is one that you just really want to remember. Okay, whoops, I'm flying on through. Okay, this is just a little bit, one more uh, depiction of the human being by the artist Kiki Smith. And she is a modern artist, very well known. But her work is uh, very emotion, emotive. Let's look at it a little comparison. Duriferous, the spear bearer by Polycletus, which is what we call the canon of proportion for Western art. And then Kiki Smith, which has this whole other emotional content to it. All right, now we're going to move on into earthworks and installation. For, so first, let's talk about the spiral jetty. Have any of you ever seen this? I have. If you drive down the interstate in Utah, you will drive right past this jetty. Now, in looking on the internet for pictures, it is now sunk into the lake. But I think it was done in the 1960s as an earthworks. And to give you an idea, that's a road that goes around in the spiral there. So it is a rather massive earthworks. Now, in earthworks, 
the point is to make a work of art and it's kind of a, um, a protest against selling art. It's more about the creating of the art itself, of leaving something of your own creative spirit behind. Now here's another earth artist. This one is pretty permanent, eh? Even though I just said it's disappearing, it's been there for 40 or 50 years. On the other hand, we have the work of Andy Goldsworthy. Now some of his work is very permanent, and we have looked at a lot of Goldsworthy this semester. But here is one of his pieces that I just found, and found to be quite beautiful. So with Andy Goldsworthy, he is making art that is sort of designed to be impermanent or it's of stone and it'll be there you know forever but he takes the natural environment and allows that to dictate his choices for the work that he will create let's talk for a moment about installations now in installations the artist goes into a space and uh, alters that space as their work of art by their nature, installations are impermanent. They are created for the show and then they are disassembled. You know, sometimes they travel around from museum to museum, but that's really the gist of it. This is that Chinese artist Wei Wei and his sunflower seed project. Now for this project, he hired like thousands of Chinese workers to actually craft and paint these sunflower seeds and he paid them a good wage. Now sunflower seeds are used in Chinese you know culinary they eat them but what he was doing was making a statement about the worker in China because here they made these tens of thousands of sunflower seeds the artist is standing in sunflower seeds but they're made out of ceramics and the uh, workers were hired to create them so it's a statement more than it is just a bunch of sunflower seeds. Another of his famous pieces is the backpacks. And, you know, he was, he got in a lot of trouble with the Chinese government because he protested the shoddy construction after the earthquake there. Oh, I guess it was five or six years ago that killed thousands, tens of thousands of people. Now, many of the deceased were actually school children because their schools collapsed upon them because they were not built correctly. So this snake, this long snake, is actually built out of backpacks. And it's the backpacks that the school children would typically wear to school. So it's representing all of the lives lost in the earthquake. This is a great instance where once you learn about the art, it means so much more than if you're just looking at this odd uh, snake on the ceiling of the museum. So we've got a couple of more slides. Uh, and this is neon art, which is a whole other valid art form in its own right. It's just one that, um, let me see, let me give you this guy's name. Oh, Dan Flavin, of course. Um, it has, it's good to notice neon art as it's used. I know there's a bridge, a walking bridge in Little Rock with beautiful light art as part of it. And the light changes and um, it's quite lovely at night. To go walking with the lights as they go through their changes. Um, so also I want you to read the little bit about primitivism which I'm not covering here and that would be on page 254. Now lastly we're going to talk about something that's in one of your movies this week and that would be the gates in Central Park. What a spectacular installation. Okay my opinion but uh, it's pretty amazing you know, what this, what this artist did. It was built by a guy named Jean-Claude and his wife. Jean-Claude was actually the female and Christo is the guy. They're a couple and she has passed on. But what they did is they did all this, these installations with fabrics. You might have heard of them. They wrapped an island in fabric. I think they wrapped the Louvre in fabric. But this one is pretty amazing. 7,500 saffron colored squares like we see here covering 23 miles in Central Park and when you look further at the pictures of it it's just so beautiful now I was not able to actually ride or walk through this uh, when it was up but I do know people who have and I actually have a little square of the fabric and according to everyone I've spoken with it was a just a spectacular feeling to walk underneath all these blowing orange pieces of fabric. 
So sculptures all around us. It's a wonderful topic and our 15 minutes is up. So thank you so much for listening and keep making that art in whatever way you do.